grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, alert your attention to the uh, sermon outline that's found in the bulletin. There are pencils in the seat rack in front of you. You can take notes and allow you to uh, have an opportunity to reflect upon the things that are talked about this morning. I um, recently started taking golf lessons again, largely because some people in the church have been beating me. <laughs> and so I found a teacher, the best in the area, and, um, and I went and saw him. And, and, and he said, well, here's a book. Why don't you read it? So I did. It didn't help. So I went back to him and I said, I, I need something more than a book. He said, okay, I'll tell you what. You sit there and I'm going to tell you in the next half an hour how to hit a great golf shot. So I sat down, and for a half an hour he lectured me, but that didn't help either. So the next week to I went to him and I said, you know, the lecture was great, but, but I need something more. He said, I got just the thing for you. He said, um, you stand there and watch me, and watch what I do in hitting a good golf shot. So I watched him for a half an hour hit great golf shot after another. And then I went home and I tried it. Hit it to the left, and I hit it to the right, and sometimes I didn't hit it at all. So I went to the next week and I said, I'm going to give up. Nothing seems to be working. He said, don't give up yet. I've got just the idea. And he gave me a golf club and he said, you try it. And I'll watch you and I'll let you know what I see. People who um, study learning say that... Um, that we will remember about 10% of what we read. We will remember about 20% of what, um, what people tell us. We will remember about 30% of what we watch other people do. But we will remember 90% of what we do ourselves with feedback. The scary thing to all of that is that they also tell us that we will forget 40% of what we learn today. So you know what that means, don't you? You're sitting here listening to a sermon, and later on this afternoon, you will remember about 20% of what I say. And tomorrow morning, you will have forgotten 40% of that 20%, and by Thursday, you won't even remember having been in worship. <laughs> I don't think Jesus had this problem. Jesus seemed to draw crowds every time he spoke. As a matter of fact, in that passage that we just heard read a few moments ago, it says that people would come from all around. They were astonished at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. They were amazed. They were amazed at what Jesus had to say. At more than one occasion, people would come and, and listen to him speak, and they would simply forget about eating altogether. That's how powerful he was as a speaker. So what's the difference? The difference for me seems to be that Jesus was not interested in passing along information. Jesus was interested in life transformation. For Jesus, the goal was not education, it was, it was putting to use, application, the things that he had to say. Because for Jesus, it's all about a change of life, becoming somebody that you weren't before you heard the words of Jesus. I remember I had um, two very different professors in college one year. The first professor got up in front of the class the first day and said, um, I don't care whether or not you come to class. Whether you are sitting here or not doesn't matter to me, because I don't get paid whether or not you are here, I'm going to get paid. The second teacher got up in front of the class that first day and said, I'm so excited about this year and this class because I really want you to understand what I'm going to tell you. And if you don't understand, call me up or come to my office anytime or you can even come to my home. And then he 
stopped and almost with tears he said, I believe what I'm going to teach you this year will change your life and make you a better person. Which class do you think I remember the most? That's definitely one, right? Dr. Evenson taught me geology at California Lutheran University in such a way that I will never look at a rock the same way again. <laughs> Jesus had a way of captivating crowds and causing them not just to remember what he was saying, but to have their lives changed by what he had to say. So Jesus was into transformation, not just information. But I want to push the envelope just a little bit farther this morning and say that Jesus was not interested in belief. He was interested in faith. Not belief, but faith. What's the difference? Well, belief is what we believe, right? Belief is a combination of a lot of things. It might be facts and figures and research and opinions and experience and things we feel. You put them all together and it creates our belief. And, and beliefs are important. I mean, the Bible will tell us as well, it's important to have correct belief. The opposite of correct belief is heresy. Nobody wants to be a heretic. We um, Northern European derived denominations have been in love with correct belief. We have produced some of the world's greatest theologians. We have assembled some of the, the greatest life-changing events in terms of, of assemblies and councils. We, we have produced incredible dogma and doctrine. All of that has been a part of who we are. We, we have our kids go to classes like catechism or confirmations all so that they will have correct belief. But did you hear the passage that was just heard, read a few moments ago? Jesus confronts a man who has an unclean demon. Guess what? The demon has correct belief. I know who you are, said the demon, the Holy One of God. And a good Lutheran church might hear that and say, hey, that's a great answer. We're going to confirm you now. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Belief is important. But Jesus is shooting for something more than belief. He is going to the heart of the matter. He wants your faith. Faith is a willingness to trust. Faith is a willingness to follow. Faith is a willingness to say, I don't understand it all. I haven't gotten it all figured out, but I will follow you. I will do what you want me to do. Don't you love that story in the Bible? It's found in both uh, Matthew and Mark about the disciples, and they're in a boat on the, on the ocean, on the lake, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes walking to them out on the water. And Peter sees that and says, Lord, if it is you, ask me to come out on the water with you. Why does Peter want to do this? Now, Peter intellectually knows that, that a human being cannot stand on a surface of water, that water cannot support us. So Peter is going after a moment of incredible faith. Not belief, but faith. I'm sure that you've heard it said. Jesus loves us just as we are. But he loves us too much to leave us where we are. I love that. And so the question I've got before you this morning is this. What sort of boat is Jesus inviting you to get out of? What sort of watery surface does Jesus want you to stand on? Where you are now and where Jesus wants to take you are two different locations. And so it's not a belief question I ask of you. It's a faith question. There's always something that Jesus wants to teach us. We're never a completed person, are we? There's always something that needs attention in our lives. There's always something that seems to be holding us back. Always something that seems to be a problem. So, do you know what it is in you? A lot of people, a lot of people might answer that question and say, you know what, I don't know. I don't know. And maybe they don't know because they don't want to know. I mean, after all, it's a scary thing 
to ask Jesus to mess up your life. It's sort of like taking your car to the mechanic. You, you get a little weary when you take your car to the mechanic because they might find something wrong with the car. Ignorance is bliss. If I don't know, then I don't need to do anything about what I don't know. But other people say, I don't know what God wants to do. I don't know what Jesus wants to teach me because I've never asked. I would like to grow stronger, I'd like to have greater faith, I would like to be able to trust, but I'm just not entirely sure how to go about the process. They've not taken a spiritual inventory. So in an effort for you to remember part of what is said this morning, at least 20% of it, and in the desire to identify places in your life that may need attention, I have put together um, a very basic spiritual inventory on the back of the sermon outline this morning. Now, truth of the matter is, we, to, we could have turned to a lot of places in Scripture to find some direction in growing our faithfulness, but I turned to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, and St. Paul lists the nine fruit of the Spirit, thinking that this is a great place to take a look at, because Paul suggests that these fruit are in all believers. They are there. They might be dormant, but they are there. So the question is, how are you doing in terms of your fruit of the Spirit? I've got homework for you today. You've got to do it today before you go to sleep. <laughs> which fruit is looking good in you, and which fruit need attention? So the first step is simply take the inventory. The second step is to pray and ask that God would grow what is low in you. And just simply know this. This is God's business. You can't make yourself grow. God wants to grow in you the design that God has for you from the moment you were born. So pray to God. The third step, and I think that this is the harder of all of the steps, is to tell somebody. You see, I don't think it, it's helpful if we keep things to ourselves. I think God has placed us within a community of faith so that our faith will grow. And, and that when you tell somebody else what you're working on, they're going to hold you accountable. And if they love you a lot, they will pray for you as well. So tell somebody. The final step is to be very <laughs> aware of how God is answering your prayer. But beware. Because God is going to put you in places and in positions that are going to force growth out of you. If you are low in love, do not be surprised that God puts a lot of unlovable people in your life. If you are low in patience, do not be surprised that God will give you a lot of high-maintenance people you have to deal with. The only way to grow is to be challenged. God does not snap a finger and poof magically give you what you need in order to grow. No, God is going to force growth out of you. And so, I think it's only fair for me to tell you what has been low in my life. What I have scored lowest in is joy. I've struggled with joy for the last couple of months for maybe a variety of reasons and had this conversation with God quite a bit. And then a couple of weeks ago at our staff retreat, I came clean with them and I told them what I was struggling with. So I have done steps one, two, and three. On to step four. You know what God did to me? This really hacks me off. <laughs> God put people in my life who have absolutely no reason to have joy, but in whom joy is oozing out of them. I go pay a visit to Sydney Lemon up at Valley Children's Hospital, and Heather Lemon greets me and says, do you know how fortunate we have been as a family to have had this place help us? And Sydney, 12 years old, says, do you know the kind of great care that I'm getting because of the doctors here and at the City of Hope? It's amazing. And I talked to a friend of mine, Jim Barlogio, whose four-year-old grandson is dealing with a brain tumor, and he says, Brian, we have never been so blessed in our life. It is totally beyond belief. 
Last week I was at a golf tournament up in Monterey. And on Saturday morning I uh, went down to a local cafe to get a cup of coffee before going out to the golf course. And, um, and I was dressed in my golf clothes, which in this case were really silly looking golf clothes. I just have to say that. And as I stood in line, a voice behind me says, great day for golf, isn't it? I turn around and there's another guy and he's also dressed in golf clothes, not, not as silly as mine. And I noticed that um, there was no left arm coming out of his sleeve. And the left side of his face was completely disfigured to the point that he only had one eye. I said the dumbest thing. I, I said, um, oh, so you're going to go watch someone play golf today? He said, no, I'm, I'm going to go play golf today. He was a, a wounded warrior from Iraq. And while he was at a hospital um, in Maryland on rehabilitation, a golf company gave him a set of golf clubs as an incentive to do something, to be active. I mean, the story inspired me. And as I got my cup of coffee and I walked away, I said, I, I hope you have a good day. He said, are you kidding me? He said, every day is a great day. People who, by the world standards, have very little reason to have joy have been plopped in my life as a way for which God has woken me up. It has been sort of like Jesus saying to me in the midst of it all, really? What reason do you have for not having joy? I'll tell you what, when the Son of God when Jesus himself challenges you with that thought, you have no reason not to have joy. God's desire is not that we become perfect. God's desire is not that we become goody two-shoes. God's desire is not that we become super know-it-all Christians. Jesus just wants to teach us so that our lives are abundant and that our lives look like him. So that the goodness that God is doing in our lives might somehow ooze out to others. And then, and then we take on the role of being a teacher to help others understand what it is that God is doing in us. So that God might do it in them. Go ahead. Step out of the comfort of your boat. Put your weight on the water. Jesus is telling you, keep your eyes on me. You can do it. <coughs> Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with us.